Yes, I'm finally going to get the sword tempered. Stop bothering me about it. Hello guys, this is Universal Giant. Welcome back for more of Let's Play The Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past. Last time, we made our way to level 6, but we're not going to be going there quite yet, because there are a couple of things that I want to grab before we go in that'll make our lives a hell of a lot easier. The first is tackling the Dwarven Swordsmith side quest. Now, I know I could have done this as soon as I got the Titan's Mitts, but in the zero times that I've ever played this game, it just didn't occur to me that this guy would have been the Smithy's partner. I know I ran into him before, and I just simply forgot about him after I got the Titan's Mitts and couldn't put together the fact that he was down there as part of the Village of Outcasts. I kind of thought that Village of Outcasts meant the screen to our left, but... Nope, there he is, and here he is. We're back to the Smithy's place. So now that his partner's returned, if we exit and re-enter, they'll give us the option of tempering our sword, which will advance to the next level of power. Unfortunately, this is going to take a little bit of time, so we're going to have to do something else in the meantime. And that something else is also going to be extremely helpful for the upcoming dungeon. I'm also not sure why... What the hell? I'm too lazy to walk over to Kakariko Village. It's all the way to our left. It would take us just a couple of seconds to get there, and... It would probably take just as long for us to warp there as it would to walk there. So why the hell not? If the bird doesn't charge us anything, I don't see any reason not to go. But yeah, now, even when we're charging now, you can see that we don't have our sword anymore. So if you're making the run over here to the graves just above, just to the north of Hyrule Castle like this, just be aware you're not going to do damage to the knights as you're running. But it's still kind of funny to see him running around without the sword or anything. He's even got a little melee if you punch. I'm not sure if that ever actually does damage. I never really bothered to try. But yeah, this grave, I just assumed that you'd be able to push your way in like all the other graves, but it turns out you just have to ram it. You figure with the dozen other graves that are in here, all of which open via pushing, that this one would also open via pushing, but it doesn't. And in here we get the magic cape. Now what this does is turns you invisible and renders you invulnerable to enemy attacks and most overworldy hazards like spikes and such. But that should have given us enough time for the dwarves to temper our sword by now, so if we run all the way back to Kakariko Village, we should be able to pick it up. And I did I just run through that guy and do him damage? I'm going to have to check the playback on that. But having the sword tempered is going to be really helpful in terms of every upcoming dungeon, actually. So there's really no reason for me not to gotten this sooner. And it's a bright, colorful orange. Now we can head all the way back to Misery Mire and actually start level 6. But before we do that, there are a couple of other things in and around the marsh that I missed my first time through that I want to pick up now before I forget about them. Won't take too long, only a couple of minutes. One of the things around here that I skipped simply because I remember the entrances to the left and to the right of level 2, which I think would correspond to this and the one to the left over here, were also part of the dungeon, so I figured in the Dark World equivalent these would also be part of the dungeon, but it turns out they're separate secrets. You can get two treasure chests in here, this one's going to be 20 rupees, and the one on the left is really the one that you came here for, the piece of heart. Just make sure you get the one on the left before you get the rupees, otherwise you're not going to be able to get the rupees, at least if you do it that way. It, that's always the way I've done the block pushing puzzle. Maybe there's another way to do it, maybe there isn't. And the one to the left, or to the right, should I say, down there, that's a fairy's fountain. I'm not sure if I'm going to show that off. If I don't need to heal myself between now and the dungeon, then I probably won't, but you've seen enough fairy's fountains to know. And I forgot that that rock was exactly in that spot. I always forget exactly where it is. I kind of tend to warp into it without realizing it. Although I swear one time I warped straight into it and it didn't do anything. It just let me stay in the dark world. But this is another block pushing puzzle that you can do to get the piece of heart. Not too difficult to figure this one out. And that's both the heart pieces in and around Misery Mire. So if we take our sparkles back into the dark world, we can finally get started on level 6. Now, I'm not entirely sure why they decided to go with the whole swamp theme for this, because level 2 was already in a swamp, and I guess this is in a marsh or something, a mire, but... It's got the same kind of feel to it as level 2, at least from the outside. 
In the inside, it's completely different. I mean, level 2 was filled with water, and there were a lot of those kinds of puzzles. But not in this dungeon. And this is one of those dungeons that you can't really appreciate your first time through. At least I know I didn't. I mean, if we just go through all the dungeons that we've been through in the Dark World up to this point, like... Level 1 was the Dark World equivalent of a palace that we'd already done before the Eastern Palace. So, in that respect, it was letting us know that things are going to be different now. Shit just got real, all that fun stuff. Level 2? When you look back on that, you just think about how much of a chore it was to even get in there in the first place, especially if you've never played it before. That it would stump you before even getting in, that you'd have to walk all the way back out, and you'd have to do some stuff in the light world before you can even get in there. And even if you did all of those things in the light world, you would still have to have gotten the Zora Flippers, which you may may not have gotten up to that point. So, it could be a real puzzler just to get into level 2, so memorable in that respect before you even do anything. But... Level 3? I'm trying to think back to level 3. Oh yeah, level 3. It's the Skull Woods. I mean, I can't remember ever seeing... A, I almost go that way. I should have gone out the other way. Yeah, in case you haven't guessed, this place is really maze-like. And the reason why that stands out more than anything, because we've already been through a similar one, Thieves Town, which was kind of maze-like, kind of trappy. This one has a lot of doors, a lot of keys, and a lot of different ways for you to go. But unlike many of the other mazes in later Zelda games, this one legitimately gives you several ways you could potentially go. So, at least in that respect, you have complete freedom in terms of how you want to tackle this dungeon. And this is why I try to remember exactly how I want to go through this, but I never really tend to go through it the same way. No matter how many times I'm really being careless, aren't I? How about we use the magic powder to get a fairy from that bubble if it'll bounce my way? I always have a plan of attack for this dungeon, but it never really goes the way I want it to. And yeah, there's one of those things that shoots at you when you use your bow and arrow. Or your, uh, sword. I don't know why I thought bow and arrow. I said shoot, but really that's the thing that does the shooting, not me. And up here, just to spite Jurojack, I'm gonna be getting the compass first. I know we still have access to the map, but we're gonna be going back through that room later. So I see no reason not to get the compass first. The map and the compass, both of which I actually missed my first time through as well. And there are a lot of rooms you could go through in this dungeon that you just miss entirely simply because there are so many different ways for you to go. But this is probably the most memorable room in this particular dungeon, where you have to move all of these blocks in such a way that you can gain access to the torches. And you have to actually light all four torches before you can progress to get the big key. Which I thought was really, really neat the first time through. I'll show off the room to the right over here. You see it's a really tight tunnel with not much going on, and then Sahasrala tells you you have to light the four torches in the other two rooms. So, if we just come over here, we can light these torches. Go into the other room and light those as well. It'll move the wall in the other room and grant us access to the room below. And now we wait 20 to 30 seconds for the room to move, just like an ocarina of time when you're waiting for King Zora to move out of the way so you can get to Jabu Jabu! In fact, if I had enough time, I'd probably edit in him making that... But I probably don't. It's really annoying to get that sound clip too, but maybe I'll do something. Whatever. If you came down here earlier, I think... One of the rooms up north, you could have walked down to see that there was this treasure chest over here that actually holds the big key. So you could take a peek in here just to see that there's a treasure chest in here, and that is your only way to get it. And now that we can open all of these big doors, we can go through all these teleporter rooms. The only purpose of this one is to get you a little bit closer to that big door that'll get you through to the other main part of the dungeon. So I'll just grab myself another fairy, and before we go there, I forget what weapon I want to have equipped at this point. I want to pick up the map, and I also want to pick up the dungeon item first. Now, I'd normally 
have come through this door by now, so I would have had a key to open that, but... For some reason, I decided to go about it another way, so I'm gonna have to grab another key somewhere else. But like I said, the thing I really like about this dungeon that you can't appreciate your first time through is just how many different ways you can go through this dungeon. There are a number of different keys, a number of different doors that you don't ever have to go through or pick up. But if you take the time to, you can actually go about this pretty much any way you like. And I really like the non-linearity. I think that's something that they're going to try to do for the next Wii U Zelda title. Or, why did I say next? It would be the first. But, I swear I heard an interview a couple of months ago, where one of the developers said that they would have really liked to take the game in that direction. Like, uh, who was it? I don't even remember who it was, but... Yeah, this will wind up leading back to the map, which is why I neglected to go there sooner. But they said they wanted to take that kind of direction with Skyward Sword, and I forget their reasoning for not doing it. But they're really looking forward to adding some kind of non-linearity to the next Zelda title, which I think is going to be really interesting. It's nifty to have a maze-like area that's difficult to get through where there's only one direction for you to go. But it's just so nice to have the literal freedom to go any direction or any path that you like. You feel like you're in control of your own destiny, like you can do whatever you want, and you can still make your own way through it, a way that nobody else will. I mean, if you go through the dungeon often enough, then sure, you're probably going to find a way, but... It's really neat that you have the power to choose your own path in this place. But other than that, there isn't much memorable about level 6. I mean, you've seen the majority of it already. There aren't too many rooms left. And there's not too much that stands out about it, really. Besides the fact that you can choose your own path, and that's not something that you can appreciate until you've already played through the game a couple of times. And I tend to get stuck on the block that the uh, cane makes, and sticking it on the switch is kind of really wonky, too. Really gimmicky item, the Cane of Somoria. And I'm going to show off another one of its uses after we get through this room. I kind of just take tank the damage from that spike trap there. I don't really care. But besides making the block, the Cane also allows you to break it and to choose projectiles in the cardinal directions. I don't know why the hell they would do that for an item. It seems kind of silly, but I suppose they've made sillier Zelda items that I can't really think of right now. What kind of sillier item have they made? I mean, the first one that comes... I didn't realize those bats do you damage. I was never stupid enough to run into them. But I, the only gimmicky item I can think about is the spinner from Twilight Princess, and that's probably one of the cooler items that you would think about, really. Because you wouldn't ever really expect the spinner. Being able to ride on the walls like that, but there are so few actual uses of the item. I mean, besides the couple of places that the game allows you to use it, that's pretty much it. There's not much else to it. And if I could get a heart from one of you guys... I know there's a bubble in the last room. I was just hoping I didn't have to waste my magic power on him. But I do like going in with full health just because, I guess. It's nice that they have the bubbles here. I'm really starting to appreciate having bubbles in rooms because now it's a free heal. But one the big reason why I have the Magic Cape is specifically for this fight. Now, even my first time through, I had absolutely no trouble with this boss whatsoever. But if you have the Magic Cape on, you can walk right into this Acidic Ooze, not get hurt by it. You can walk right up to the Eyeballs, they can't do you damage. And that Electric-type move that the Big Eyeball uses won't even touch you. So, if I, I can just sit here, spam myself the newly tempered sword that we have, and this guy is dead before he knew what hit him. Almost a shame to call that thing a boss, but that was level six. What's that? This is supposed to be blind. I'm not supposed to know what I'm doing. 
But what about all the people that were complaining? You're supposed to do this, you're supposed to do that, you're supposed to get this. Why don't you have this? Why aren't you doing it this way? This would help you out a lot. I, re I shouldn't give a shit what they say? I should just do whatever I feel like and screw everyone who doesn't like it? There are enough people that like it the way it is that I should just ignore the trolls? I guess you're right. Well then. First reactions to level 6 tomorrow. This is Universal Giant, and I'll see you then. April Fools! You spoiling bastards.